Welcome to the Secure World Session. We are a cybersecurity podcast that is all about access. Access Access to people and ideas that can impact your cybersecurity career and help you secure your organization. Hi, my name is Bruce Sussman, and I am Director of Content at Secure World and also your podcast host for this, our 28th episode. And in today's session, we are speaking to the man who recently uncovered a maddening cyber attack against the World Health Organization. In case you're listening to this long after the fact, it's the year 2020, and the WHO is currently responding to the worldwide coronavirus pandemic. Aside from sirens, large portions of the outside world have gone quiet. As people shelter in place and many isolate themselves to limit the spread of COVID-19. The cyber attorney Alexander Herbalis is one of these people. He lives in New York City and he's been sick with coronavirus-like symptoms and he is in self-quarantine right now, along with his beagle. Now, a sickness did not keep him from talking to us or from making a discovery that made headlines around the world. Sophisticated hackers are targeting the World Health Organization and they prepared to do it nearly nine months ago, and they waited. Until the right moment to launch the attack, and the coronavirus pandemic was that moment. Now, I do want to warn you about something. This podcast episode may have steam coming out your ears. Because of how low hackers can go and how many of them see this pandemic as opportunity. Here's my remote interview with Blackstone Law Group's Alexander Urbalas, and my first question to him was this. How did you react when you uncovered a cyber attack against the World Health Organization right in the middle of our coronavirus pandemic? It was immediately visceral. I mean, and one of the first things that I wanted to do was to, to validate the data that I saw and to make sure that this wasn't something that had been reverberating throughout the DNS or the domain name system for a while. Um, when you're talking about DNS related intelligence, one of the things that you have to be very careful of is to make sure that you're not looking at something that actually happened in the past. You need to validate that this is in fact live. So that's immediately what I did. Um, and then I saw that I was looking at a very sophisticated state level or state sponsored attack against the World Health Organization in the midst of, I think, the, uh, the greatest health crisis that we have faced in, in, in recorded history here. Yeah, that is phenomenal. And I can understand your visceral reaction. That is, it's really, when I read about this, I just, I was, there was like steam coming out of my ears. It's just oh, yeah. so maddening. Uh, and I'll tell you too, what, one of the other things that was, that was interesting about this attack too is that it, it was very visceral at, at the outset when I realized that this was in fact a, a real and live attack against the, the WHO, the World Health Organization. However, uh, I also was not incredibly surprised because this is a group whose data and whose TTPs we've been tracking for quite a while now. And um, this wasn't mentioned in, in a lot of the coverage about the, the attack, but we had seen them target the, the World Health Organization previously as well. So this was a one of their favorites. Um, uh, and uh, along with other IGOs, other intergovernmental organizations like the, the United Nations and the International Federation for the Red Cross, uh, there were a lot of IGOs that this group has targeted. The WHO, uh, we saw them target several times in the past as well. But seeing them targeted in the middle 
of the coronavirus uh, health crisis and worldwide hysteria because of this pandemic was certainly visceral. Yeah, that's I mean, that's just a new low, right, for hackers. And sometimes you wonder how low they can go, but we're seeing it right now. Right, right. And you know, and the other thing, too, is, you know, the, these guys, I always like to make the distinction, too, between the, the hackers and the criminals, right? Because I, mm-hmm. I still consider myself a hacker. You know, I, I think it's sort of a, a philosophical mindset more than and it has to do with, you know, breaking the law. These guys, you know, were, were opportunistic, I, I think, threat actor, state sponsored, state affiliated or, or straight up nation state uh, criminals. Yeah, that's that's amazing. OK, so let's get into how you uncovered this attack um, and what did you see and what do we know about how the attack was unfolding? Sure. Well, you know, it's it's a bit unusual sometimes for people to um, ingest law for uh, intelligence from a law firm. Um, we are certainly not your typical set of lawyers. We're not your typical law firm. One of the things we've done is that we, we've married the practice of law with the practice of information security. And, and in so doing over the last several years, I created and coded every single line of this myself, a DNS monitoring and threat intelligence platform that I call Omni. I'm a Latin nerd as well. It was a classicist. So <laughs> I see. Omni obviously <laughs> means, you know, all things, but it's an acronym, you know, where, uh, that stands for open source multidisciplinary network intelligence as well. Nice. Very nice. Yeah. So it's actually got a meeting, you know, <laughs> in addition to the, the classical association. Um, and, and essentially by scouring massive amounts of live and historical DNS data, detecting deltas between times and other techniques that, that I've developed, we are able to identify early stage indicators of cyber attacks targeting our clients. And we have built up a, a very significant client base some of the world's largest companies in finance, healthcare, pharmaceuticals, um, industry leaders um, in, in many different industries around the world. And we monitor the entire DNS for them. We alert them when we see these early stage indicators of cyber attacks. Um, and in so doing, we have come across a lot of data that relates to um, things like credentials harvesting, you know, you're stealing usernames and passwords. Malware distribution, misinformation, brand impersonation, counterfeiting, you know, a lot of the stuff that, that keeps the bad guys afloat. Um, but we're also very good at recognizing patterns and pattern recognition. And the, we have been able to latch on to the TTPs or the tactics, techniques and procedures of several very sophisticated APT groups. Um, some of these groups, we do not know which APT they may belong to. It may be APT 10. It could be APT 33. There's so many, there's so much overlap between these various groups. And by APT, by the way, you do mean, you know, basically nation state backed. That's correct. Hackers. Yep. Yep. Okay. That's right. Yeah. The uh, APT standing for advanced persistent threats, which are usually synonymous with, with nation state, um, hacking groups. Excellent. Um, and, um, or state sponsored or state affiliated uh, activity. Um, and so we have been tracking a, a number of APT groups and some of them, like I mentioned, we don't know exactly who they are. They could be uh, different states, could be combinations of states. It could be uh, groups of threat actors who have multiple taskmasters working for several different states, which is, um, I think, quite likely the case with some of the actors that we are monitoring. Um, but because we have been watching this activity for so long, we have our own sets of TTPs or tactics, techniques and procedures for which we're monitoring. Well, this WHO attack resided on a domain and utilized a URL structure that we were looking for for a while. And once we saw this activated, our DNS intelligence platform immediately picked it up and we began uh, investigating this particular URL on that particular site, and it did match the TTPs of a group that we had been watching that was targeting several other IGOs and the WHO itself uh, from 2018 onwards. So that's how we picked these guys up initially, was that their activities and the URLs and the domains that they were uh, utilizing as part of their infrastructure matched what we had seen them do in the past. Okay, so you had some telltale signs that, you know, alerted you. What did you see with regard to this attack and what was underway against the World Health Organization? 
Well, this one was, was quite interesting. We were able to validate that this was um, up and live, but we were not able to actually see the attack itself. Um, and that's because whoever the threat actors are that are behind this attack, and some people have equated this with, with dark hotels, some people have equated it with, with uh, South Korean interests, and others, uh, to be quite frank, we are just not entirely sure. We don't know exactly who it is that's behind this, but we do know that the activities that we've seen them engage in in the past have been very sophisticated and uh, certainly matched the TTPs of the WHO attack. And so one of the things that they have done in the past and did with this particular attack was that they limited the universe of people who could resolve that URL to only those persons who would be working at the World Health Organization. So it became very difficult to get screenshots, to pull data, et cetera. So we were really looking at a lot of intelligence that was on the periphery of the attack. We knew that it was happening, but we couldn't actually see it without um, crossing the line, perhaps, and, and hacking into um, the server that was was hosting the attack. And, and we don't do that. We're <laughs> I'm a lawyer. I don't break the law. <laughs> yes, it's supposed to keep them, not break them. That's All true. Right. <laughs> Good point. So what what do you know now about what was actually going on? I've read accounts of this, but I, I want to hear from you. What do you know that was happening? Yeah, I mean, what we know is that it was a... Um, it, it was, in fact, a live and sophisticated and extraordinarily targeted attack. Uh, my understanding is that it was a highly targeted spear phishing that involved uh, only a handful of employees at the World Health Organization. So this was a very low noise attack. It was very much under the radar. It was using a URL and a domain that uh, had been dormant for a long time. We were waiting for this to be to, to become active. And um, and when it did, it um, it sprung up and it wound up being a, an incredibly significant um, and sophisticated cyber attack against, I think, one of the, the most important intergovernmental organizations on the planet right now. And I had read that it was it was essentially mimicking the internal email system in, in those phishing attempts. Is that to try and harvest credentials? Is that true? <laughs> That's correct. I, from my, that's my understanding of it as well. Again, I, we, we weren't able to actually resolve the attack and see it, but from what we could tell based on the structure of the URL, the whole idea behind the attack was to harvest the credentials of select World Health Organization employees by mimicking the portal that they use to log into their, their internal file system from an external source. So essentially the external link, the external portal, into the WHO is what these threat actors uh, duplicated so that they could steal the credentials of these WHO employees. And the other thing to, to mention, too, and this wasn't um, very widely reported either outside of um, the, the actual attack on WHO, but this threat, this group of threat actors did not singularly target just the WHO at that time and date that we had detected this. We had also seen them um, target uh, a specialized component of the United Nations, as well as a uh, internet service provider in the um, Zurich area as well. So again, very highly targeted spear phishing uh, is what this, this group of threat actors was engaged in, targeting the WHO, but also the UN and a Zurich-based ISP. So all very highly targeted intel collection activities yeah that is really fascinating and, and when you say that i i'm going to get your take on this because what i hear is you know they were going after high value targets with specific uh attack methods and probably a specific end game in mind against those targets is that is that kind of your takeaway I think it's very easy to uh, come to that conclusion, given the level of sophistication that we had seen. Uh, give, uh, and one of the, the other interesting components of this is that the, this domain on which the attack resided had existed without being used for about nine or ten months. It had just been sitting there, just sort of marinating, you know, 
allowing it to age and age with respect to domains gives them some kind of integrity, some kind of a, 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 an, an additional layer of trust that are associated with them. And then we knew this one was, was eventually going to be activated and we, we were right about it. Um, but uh, yeah, this was certainly very targeted, very specific. Um, and it makes you wonder about the, the motivations here. I mean, the timing, obviously, in the midst of the coronavirus, COVID-19 uh, world hysteria uh, on March 13th, just a couple of weeks ago. I mean, any any nation that could acquire or any company that could acquire uh, an advanced preview of the World Health Organization statistics with respect to um, the the pandemic itself and its proliferation in other countries or information or intelligence with respect to palliative care, vaccines underway. You know, all of this information could give a country or private industry um, or even, I, don't, I dare say, investors uh, a massive leg up uh, in terms of competitive business as well as um, nation state level intelligence. Yeah. Wow. That is that is chilling when I hear you say that. And and. I we know that right that these nation states there's everybody's got a different motivation but the motivation level is high for a lot of different reasons which you just laid out. Oh, absolutely. You know, and and I think we're just scratching the tip of the iceberg here. I mean, having worked in intelligence a long time ago myself, I uh, I have always found that um until you actually find what the specific motivations are, it's all conjecture. And when you find out exactly why somebody was targeting X or Y or Z, the um, there's always a eureka moment where you say to yourself, oh, wow, oh, my God, I hadn't thought of that. That's brilliant. So, you know, there's in all likelihood, you know, this, this is all conjecture as to the motivations. You know, some of them are, are going to be obvious, some of them not so obvious. But I think um, if we were to learn specifically who these individuals were that were targeted, which is an unknown for us right now, um, I think we might see some uh, the, the the real underlying motivation shine through. Interesting to hear him talk about the motivation, isn't it? Perhaps we will see that motivation as we look back at this moment in history. Now, there is much more to come in our interview with Alex as he tracks URLs being registered around the globe, and he shares the specific insights for organizations about cybersecurity during this coronavirus pandemic. That is coming up. Well, I want to let you know about a new resource for helping your end users work remotely from home. Trend Micro's Vice President for Cybersecurity, Greg Young, did a recent write-up. And here are three things that we call our Trend Micro Top 3. Number one. Employees new to working from home can unknowingly become victims of new threats introduced in this remote environment. Number two, one of the tools you really want to provide is an enterprise managed cloud storage account for work documents. That way employees don't find free versions or store things in their personal cloud storage accounts, which may not be safe or private. Number three, and I'm quoting Greg Young here. In the best of times, remote workers are often left to their own devices, pun intended, for securing their work at home experience. Home offices are already usually much less secure than corporate offices. Weak routers, unmanaged PCs, and multiple users means home offices become an easier attack path into the enterprise. It doesn't make sense, he says, to have workers operate in a less secure environment in this context. Give them the necessary security tools and operational tools to do their business. Now, Greg goes on to unpack a number of considerations and best practices and pitfalls in his post that he titled, Suddenly Teleworking Securely. I'm placing a link to this resource in our show notes. And thanks again to Trend Micro, our premier podcast partner. Now, let's continue with today's featured interview. Cyber attorney Alexander Urbelas is a partner and founder of Blackstone Law Group in New York City. He's also been a CISO and in the past a chief compliance officer. 
He uncovered a recent cyber attack against the World Health Organization, but that is just the start of his coronavirus discoveries in cyberspace. Let's go back now to our conversation. Um, Okay, so let me widen this out a little bit because I know part of the reason that you were able to track this, you mentioned your DNS intelligence platform. And one of the things that I understand you've been tracking is the sheer volume when it comes to URLs, which are being registered relating to either coronavirus or COVID-19 and and the concern about that. So kind of unpack that for us, if you would. Sure, sure. Yeah, we do a lot of DNS monitoring and monitoring of registrations of certain types of, of information, categories, strings of interest. And we've been monitoring for corona related domain names or names that uh, include the string COVID-19 or the string Wuhan or the or permutations of the string coronavirus uh, since last February. And in late February, we started to see some massive spikes of registrations. I mean, to give you a, a baseline example, you know, we do some some work with um, sports leagues and, um, and and a lot of different sports teams and if you think about something like, um, you know, a major sporting event that would capture the world's interests, you know, leading up to a major sporting event, you see maybe 10 or 20 different um, domain registrations per day. And that that's a lot, you know, to deal with. Some of it might have to do with streaming, counterfeiting, fake ticket sales, et cetera. You know, whether you're talking about, you know, the World Series, Super Bowl, World Cup, there's always a lot of opportunism. But you don't see more than, you know maybe a little more than 20. You know, back in late February, we started to see massive spikes of registration with respect to the coronavirus and related uh, topics and activities. Um, It at first started out around 450 domains per day we were seeing, which when you compare to like a worldwide sporting event, that's huge, right? I mean, it's massively, it's exponentially large, right? We are, as of the last couple of weeks now, seeing over 2,500 new domain name registrations every single day. It's wow. incredible. I have never seen anything like this with in in the domain name system, and I've been uh, you know working in technology for for 25 years. This is a, an incredible and hysterical spike of domain name registrations. And I think what this means is that globally there are opportunistic actors seeking to exploit this health crisis for personal gains. And some of these domains are just, you know, base salesman related domains, you know, salesmanship at at its worst, focusing on, on masks and preventative care, cleaning supplies, cleaning services, um, bogus vaccines, palliative care. Um, you know, I, I hate to say it, but there's a lot of lawyers getting in on the mix now, too. I mean, people are having to, to breach contracts and breach leases and things like that. And there are a massive amount of coronavirus related lawyer sites coming in. But interesting. You know, it's uh, yeah. And you're not one of them, right? <laughs> no, I'm certainly not one of them. <laughs> no, that's the last thing I want to do is litigate a, a breach of contract. Issue. Um, <laughs> yes, exactly. It relates to the coronavirus. God, no. Um, but it's dangerous, too, because some of these sites are, are rife with with misinformation and some are seeking to induce victims to do things like donate ostensibly to an organization like the CDC or the Red Cross or other relief efforts only to, to pocket the cash themselves. I mean, when we first started monitoring for this, we identified very quickly a site that um, was impersonating PayPal and soliciting donations that would ostensibly go directly to the CDC. And it was it was pure fraud. Um, wow. And others are other domain names that we're seeing are, are being used for phishing and the distribution of malware. So, I mean, the takeaway here is to be extraordinarily skeptical of anything that pushes you to download files, provide your banking information, credit card information. And, you know, God forbid, any kind of uh, employee login or account information. Yeah, that is that is uh, phenomenal. And I know I've, we've reported on our website at secureworldexpo.com on some of these different phishing URLs and these attacks going on, even against healthcare professionals themselves, which is just, oh, it just makes me so mad. But 
another one that, again, everybody's looking for the answer here, right? And a lot of people are scared, even though most of us are hanging in there. A lot of people are scared and, and these scammers are taking advantage of that. And one of the stories we reported on, Alex, and, and you may know about this one, but um, there was a website. It was actually the first one that the U.S. Department of Justice issued an injunction against. And it was selling the WHO vaccine kits. And good news, the vaccines were free. You just had to pay for shipping and handling for four ninety five. I mean, that is ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, there's base and rank opportunism with any kind of worldwide type of uh, hysteria here. And I mean, right. and this is this is just coming at a massive clip. Um, I, di- I did see that. And I, I remember actually looking at that particular domain name and, and being actually rather impressed with how quickly the U.S. Department of Justice had uh, taken action against the, the fraudsters behind that domain. I mean, I, I think that's really great. The problem is it's shoveling, you know, what against the tide. Right. And, you know, there, there's better ways to engage in enforcement. And some of this just really needs to be blocked. And when we're talking about protecting enterprises. There really are very few business related um, interests in allowing the navigation to this massive influx now of coronavirus related domains there are very few definitive sources and those sources can be whitelisted. Um, but, you know, because we're seeing twenty five hundred domains per day, it's actually, you know, becoming extraordinarily burdensome to to even blacklist all of those. Let's say, you know, on on a firewall or, or through Mimecast or, you know, or whatever the technology you're using to prevent your users from navigating to these dangerous sites. So it's, um, you know, on the one hand, I think um, looking at what DOJ did there, I think it's extraordinarily laudable. And I think we really do owe them, you know, a, a debt of gratitude for acting so quickly in, in the face of this. Uh, I also think that from a legal standpoint and speaking as a lawyer now, we should. Um, reconsider whether or not we need additional federal and state laws that prohibit the taking advantage of both in the physical and digital realm of um, these types of health and humanitarian crises uh, of the sort that we find ourselves in right now. Um, I think there should be additional criminal consequences for taking advantage of people's um, insecurities and, and, um, and capitalizing on on this health related pandemic that we're facing right now. Yeah, it sounds like maybe you're suggesting something akin to price gouging laws, which we know exist a lot of places. And and sometimes, right as I know you you probably know this better than I do, but the law is behind the real world developments, which would be twenty five hundred URLs a day related to the coronavirus selling whatever it is. That, that's correct. That, that's absolutely right. Yeah. And, and the laws that are, that are, um, that surround price gouging. A- absolutely. I mean, we need similar types of laws that apply, I think, to the digital realm that prevent threat actors and, and criminals from taking advantage in this sphere as well. Um, and, and I think the laws should apply extraterritorially, meaning outside the borders of the state or outside the borders of the federal government. Um, you know, we really need to try to deter this type of uh, behavior in the future as well. Um, you know, another thing to, to mention, too, is to see, you know, look, there's a lot of people coming together on this. And there were even um, some domain name registrars, Namecheap in particular, that um, responded. I think it was to the call of the New York State Attorney General asking for domain name registrars to actually prevent the registration of coronavirus related domains and Namecheap was one of the only ones that actually heeded that call. Um, I think what they did was they in the search uh, system that they're using to identify whether a domain is available. If people are putting in coronavirus, it's just automatically returning as, as not available. But a lot of other registrars had balked at this request because um, unfortunately, be, because of legal reasons um, right now, they enjoy immunity from any kind of uh, lawsuit because they're essentially acting as an interactive computer service. Uh, my understanding is that they would have Section 230 CDA immunity or the Communications Decency Act immunity uh, because they're not policing what happens on their network. The more they police, the more they regulate the content of what happens and the information that flows through on their networks, 
um, the more likely they are to lose that kind of immunity. Right. Um, and so there's another crossover between the digital and, and, and legal space here is that if we want to encourage companies like these domain name registrars and Namecheap to engage in practices that essentially protect the entire world, we should give them an incentive to do so. We should make it very clear to them somehow. Um, and, and this would have to be a legislative pronouncement, something Congress could do, that they will not lose their immunity from suit by helping to uh, enhance the information security posture of, you know, not just the United States, but I think the entire world right now. Yeah, that is that is really interesting. And, and I hadn't even thought of that angle. So thank you for bringing that up. And I know right. just right now, I mean, it, it's a challenging landscape and obviously organizations like Facebook with all the political speech and language, they're finding themselves as kind of the gatekeeper and it's creating challenges, but yeah, you know, we got to figure all the stuff out, right? <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a lot to figure out these days. <laughs> yes, indeed. indeed. Uh, but, you know, if we tried to figure it all out, we'd never sleep. Yeah. That's, <laughs> I have a feeling you're already on that train somehow, but <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I right, just... can't see my face right now. Yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> well, I have just two last questions for you, Alex. Uh, the, the last, the next, the last question that I have is if you were advising your clients, and I know that's what you do. Um, yeah, you know, you, you had the ear of a security team or a CISO right now, which you certainly do on this uh, podcast. Uh, what, what would you say about this environment that we're in? Any, any kind of like uh, quick advice? Yeah, I mean, a couple of things uh, is that, um, and, and a lot of a lot of I think CISOs uh, will agree with this is that you you can't just act defensively and reactively anymore. You have to be hunting these types of threats. You have to be very proactive. Um, you, you need to find these things and block them before they hit your network. And that was the whole idea of the DNS intelligence platform that we put together is to move from being from being reactive to proactive and, and facilitating those types of cybersecurity practices. So instead of reacting to a phishing attack as it happens, you know, the intel that you need and the intel essentially that we generate allows you to alter your defensive, pro, your defensive posture well ahead of that particular attack. So I think intelligence is key. User awareness and user education cannot be underestimated um, with respect to its importance anymore. Uh, it, it is so important, I think, to show them what these attacks are going to look like, socialize what the, the, these real phishing portals and credentials harvesting portals are going to look like. And again, that comes from your intel sources, live attacks that you have detected and thwarted against an organization. And then I think thirdly, and I think this is in, incredibly important, is that we, we need to acknowledge that there is the technology that we have is not 100% effective that. And, and again, this goes back to user training and user awareness. And I think that, you know, the, the bulwark of our organizations and our institutions are always going to be our users. And if, and it's our job to properly train them. And that gray matter that we have in between our ears, I think is the best anti phishing and the best anti scam te technology that has ever been developed. You know, if something does not pass that smell test, you got to train your users, you know, to report the, the email, send it to your security operations team, use that phishing button, whatever the hell it is that you have implemented um, and, and train those users to um, rely on that gray matter between their brains. That is, I think, the most amazing technology that yeah, that's ever been developed. Well, I'm excited to hear you say that. And I think that a lot of CISOs definitely are coming into that view. Uh, because I know we've had a couple of conferences uh, of our cybersecurity conferences, which are across the country each year. A couple of CISOs last year in particular had titles something along the lines of humans are not the weakest link. They're the strongest link. And yeah. I think it was that. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's true. I mean, look, yeah, the, the, the users, the humans make mistakes, but, you know, we're, we're also the front lines here. And, yeah. Um, yeah. They, and can absolutely be the strongest link. I, I would love to see those those talks, actually. OK, yeah, <laughs> that's fantastic. All right. I'll have to get you the slides on one of those. Yeah. No uh, <laughs> great. Uh, now, final question. And this is I, I want to ask how you are doing personally. I understand that you are self-quarantined right now. 
I am. I am. I'm, I'm out in the mountains of Pennsylvania without my family and uh, just to, uh, an aggressively uh, affectionate beagle to keep me comfortable <laughs> here. And um, I came out here about two weeks ago uh, to get the house ready. To, we were going to pack up the kids, my wife and I, and, and leave to sort of serve our little weekend getaway place uh, in Pennsylvania. And uh, I came out here a day and a half before the family. And all of a sudden, I, I started to get really ill. And I had uh, a fever and a low-grade fever that just wouldn't go away. I had a lot of body aches. I had uh, digestive issues, um, lots of fatigue. I mean, I had, you know, most of the um, the symptoms of the coronavirus itself, ironically. And um, thankfully, I didn't have respiratory issues. Um, you know, some difficulty getting up and down the stairs and stuff like that, but that's sort of normal. So uh, because my symptoms weren't... Uh, severe enough to warrant me getting a test in a hospital. I have not been tested. And this thing has really been up and down, I have to say. Uh, the first couple of days, I was um, in pretty bad shape. It was it was rough. And then I got better. And then last Friday afternoon, you know, sort of packing it up for the day, getting ready. I, I felt okay. And then the fever came back. And, oh boy. And, it, and it was bad. And it spiked that night to its highest level. And um, I'm just, you know, I, I took Tylenol. I'm doing everything that, that my doctor friends are telling me to do and staying away from the ER. Uh, and then the next day was was pretty bad, too. I was in I was in bad shape and it's, it becomes very worrying. And um, and then, you know, I'm in better shape. Now, the, you know, for most of this week, I was actually in, in pretty good shape, and except, uh, again, on Friday. My feet yeah. started to come back, and I was starting to have a massive headache, and then I was getting – it's so worrying because you, you don't know what this is. It could be a virus. It could be the coronavirus, and you know that things can go south pretty quickly. And I've got two kids, and, um, you know, it's, it's a terrible and scary thing, and um, – you know, one of the things parents always dream about is, oh, it would be nice to have a couple of days away from the kids. And, <laughs> yes. You know, I, I've had it now, and I just can't wait to hold my children again uh -huh. and see my beautiful wife. And you know, every every night, my son and I, we FaceTime before we he goes to bed. I go to bed shortly thereafter. I've got no reason to stay up anymore. All right. And um, and we say to each other, he he calls it the nighttime poem. And um, and it's Robert Frost the stopping by the woods on the snowy evening and the last few words of which he doesn't realize, you know, how, how, how sort of dark they are. But the last couple of words of that poem are, you know, and these woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep, miles to go before I sleep. And, and those those lines, when, when he says them with me, that's that's about not giving up. That's about, you know, it's easy to to just to stay in those dark, deep woods and let go. But, you know, it reminds me, we've got a lot of work to do. I've got, I've made promises to my wife and my children and we have to stay healthy. And, um, yeah, I, uh, I get emotional just thinking about it and I can't wait to see my wife and kids again. Yeah, that's great. Well, I, I know that you will. I'm glad to hear that you're, you're trying to be on the mend here. And, um, Gosh, I mean, I just all the best to you and your family and that and and to know that you're not alone in that. Right. A lot of people are self quarantining. A That's lot right. of us going through yeah. that kind of separation. And it's tough. It's tough. You know, no, I mean, it, it's it's a crazy thing to think about. Right. Where uh, it, quarantining and, you know, sitting on the couch and catching up on Netflix or, you know, old issues of The New Yorker or whatever the hell it is, you know, um, <laughs> yeah. is uh, is an heroic activity these days. Right, right. Well, I would also say sharing your expertise, alerting the world to the WHO attack, all those things are also heroic. So thank you for doing that in the middle of all that you're going through personally, Alex. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, that's very kind of you to say. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk with you and to your audience. It's been a, a wonderful distraction. Well, needless to say, we really appreciate Alex sharing his story. And while he is 
self-quarantine no less that is outstanding thank you alex and i also want to alert you to where you can find the latest information relating to the coronavirus and secure world 17 regional Cybersecurity conference go to our website right now secureworldexpo.com and look for the banner at the top that says announcement on coronavirus that is an faq page and it's frequently updated also Under the Resources tab on our website, you can find the calendar for our daily cybersecurity briefings, which we are calling the Secure World Remote Sessions. It's our way to carry out our mission of connecting, informing, and developing leaders in cybersecurity. And right now, of course, it happens to be digital collaboration. But soon enough, we'll all be meeting up again. So hang in there wherever you are in the world. We can Thanks again to Trend Micro for sponsoring today's podcast. And thanks to our fantastic editor, Pete. Really appreciate his expertise week in and week out. On behalf of the entire Secure World team, I'm Bruce Sussman, your host of the Secure World Sessions. And let's catch up again on Tuesday.